Hello. Thank you for joining us for tonight's educational webinar on advancements in shoulder replacement. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Scott Stevens, orthoneuro -orth orthopedic shoulder and elbow surgeon. Dr. Stevens is a board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder and elbow surgery and sports medicine. He performs all aspects of shoulder surgery from minimally invasive arthroscopy to complex shoulder replacements. Areas of special interest for Dr. Stevens include shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff, distal humerus fractures, and biceps tendon ruptures or tendonitis. Dr. Stevens will answer questions following his presentation. Please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Stevens? All right. All right, well, I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Um, so my talk tonight is, it's a pretty interesting talk. You know, when I was a shoulder fellow 10 years ago, uh, patients would ask me, you know, I'm gonna, you know, should I wait a couple more years until I get my shoulder replaced because, you know, the technology is gonna improve. And back then I was 2012, I said, you yeah, know, I really don't know how much it's gonna get better than it is now. And nowadays in the last 10 years, the advances have been, you know, monumental. You know, compared to like hip and knee replacements, which really haven't changed for the last 20 or 30 years, shoulder replacement has gone through, you know, you know, multiple different cycles where the technology keeps improving, advances that you know, we really didn't even anticipate 10 years ago. It's, it's been pretty amazing to be a part of that. So just a little bit about myself. I grew up outside Akron, Ohio. I did my undergraduate at John Carroll University. I did my residency down here in Columbus, Ohio, in the Mount Carmel system after graduating uh, from med school at University of Toledo. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do two uh, fellowships. I did a, uh, a sports only fellowship where I was fortunate enough to be able to work with the Miami Heat and then a shoulder uh, and elbow fellowship in San Antonio where it's mainly focused on shoulder arthroplasty or shoulder replacements. Following uh, uh, my fellowships, I practiced in Houston for three and a half years. Uh, then when we started having uh, kids kind of ran home to be near the parents as fast as possible, I essentially drove through the night. So we've been here for now uh, seven years. So it's been great. So uh, really just to the basics, you know, what is arthritis? Arthritis very simply is the loss of the soft tissue cartilage at the ends of the bone. When the cartilage uh, erodes, it, 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 it allows the prominence of the subchondral bone. And essentially there's no cushioning on the ends of the bone anymore. And there can be a variety of different reasons for why we see this. We can see it from degenerative, just very straightforward osteoarthritis. We can have inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. We can have a bad injury that, that damages the cartilage an infection, or for patients that a very specific subtype who have uh, long-standing rotator cuff tears and it affects the mechanics of the joint, it can start eroding away the cartilage in a very similar fashion and changing the overall mechanics of the joints. Regardless of what it is, the, the overall arching cause is uh, and result is exposure of subchondral bone. And so it's extremely common. It affects more than 50 million adults and even up to 300,000 children with juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And, and the symptoms can come and go. Patients can say it's been bothering for years. They have good days, they have good, bad days, but eventually the, the bad days start outweighing the good days. And especially when patients start having pain at night, then it becomes a more prominent uh, problem because if it's affecting your sleep, it's really affecting your quality of life. Patients lose range of motion of, of their arms. Uh, they lose the ability to do basic functions. That's when they start looking for different treatment options. And so with severe arthritis, you can have chronic pain. It can affect your daily activities, even doing things just like uh, combing your hair, affect the quality of your life. And I think the, the main complaint I get as a shoulder surgeon is, is pain at night when trying to sleep. That's typically what brings people in for surgery. So some basic anatomy of the shoulder. The shoulder is made up of three bones. It, it, it consists of the long bone of your arm, your humerus, your shoulder blade or scapula, as well as your strut-like bone, the clavicle, which helps hold that arm out to length. Overall, the, the shoulder is a ball and socket joint, and it's the most unstable joint we have in our body. It's why we're allowed to have such good range of motion in it, why we can swim, hit a tennis ball, throw a football. Uh, it's because it's a ball and socket joint, and we re but we rely on those rotator cuff tendons for that range of motion. And at the very ends of the bone, we have soft cartilage, uh, which helps protect that joint and allows the range of motion. The problem is the, the cartilage is almost like treads on a tire where eventually that tread starts wearing thin. And when it starts wearing thin, it starts becoming painful. You'll start having crepitus or cracking with, with motion, pain with motion. And you know the main provider stability around the shoulder is the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, and these structures are, 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 is what allows us to have this range of motion in, in uh, uh, the shoulder. 
And so basic symptoms that we see with arthritis are pain, swelling, you'll get loss of motion, stiffness, and, and a classic symptom I see is catching and popping. And so our first step in, in, in orthopedic evaluation or from your family uh, uh, care provider is we get x-rays. X-rays give us a lot of information. And some of the classic hallmark signs that we see with osteoarthritis, we see a loss of joint space because on the x-rays, all we can see is bones. We can't see the cartilage, but we see the two bones getting closer together. We use a term called bone on bone arthritis. And what that means is that cartilage is starting to erode away. And those two bones or the subchondral bone, which is below the cartilage, uh, starts getting closer and closer together in the two different joint spaces. Uh, we start uh, from the increased uh, force put on the bone, we start developing bone spurs uh, that can help impede the motion as well. The bone becomes, because it, there's no soft cartilage holding that, those bones apart, and those bones are rubbing together, we start getting bone spurs. It's kind of like if you have a car tire, if that, if that uh, uh, tire goes flat and you're rubbing the rim against the road, it eventually starts denting the, the, the rim. The same thing happens with our bones, where when you lose that nice soft, soft uh, tissue on the ends, it starts eroding away that bone. And when that happens, the fluid from the joint can actually get into the bones, what we call bone cysts. And then once the arthritis advances to the point to where there's no more cartilage and it, those two bones are rubbing together for long periods of time, it can permanently alter the joint and change the overall alignment. So for, for really mild or moderate arth arthritis or for the first line treatments that we see, even if it's severe, our first options are really activity modification. Very simply, if, if it hurts, don't do it. Uh, we still want to do the things that we love in life, but some uh, small little changes can have a huge uh, uh, effect on, on your, your quality of life and your daily activities and the amount of pain you're experiencing during those. Uh, as long as we don't have any st uh, stomach or kidney issues, we can try anti-inflammatory medications. You know, physical therapy can help. You always want to maintain your motion, maintain your strength. Uh, it's a little bit counterintuitive sometimes, but by, by maintaining your motion, maintaining your activity level, that can actually decrease arthritic pain sometimes. Uh, it's really when we get still, like we're sitting at night, sleeping at night, waking up in the morning for the first time, that's when we can really have some pain. So moving during the day, a lot of times that pain goes away. If it's really mild arthritis, uh, we can sometimes try a shoulder arthroscopy or use a small little camera and go in there and kind of scrape and clean up that cartilage. But once there, it becomes so severe, uh, we start talking about a shoulder replacement. And my analogy to this is, is almost like if you have a small pothole in the road, you can sometimes fill that in or smooth it out. But when you have multiple potholes in a road, it's better to, to, to repave it. And that's really where a shoulder replacement is. And unlike knee and hip replacements, shoulder replacements have two types of replacements based on the fact is if, if we have an intact rotator cuff uh, tendon or not. Uh, the first one is an anatomic shoulder replacement. And that's very simply replacing the ball and socket just as they are. But for patients who have torn rotator cuff tendons, that's when we start leaning towards a reverse shoulder replacement. And I'll explain both in a little bit more detail in a second. So what is a shoulder replacement? Very simply, it's taking the damaged part of the shoulders and replacing those with artificial components, uh, which we call a prosthesis. Uh, for all replacements we have in our body, hip, knee, shoulder, elbow, it's always some form of metal and plastic. In the early 2000s, they tried to put metal on metal and there was a disaster because the metal ions would rub, uh, rub off on those uh, into the bloodstream, causing allergy. So we always have plastic, which doesn't have any reaction to the body. And so when we're looking at a shoulder replacement specifically, what are we replacing? We're replacing the humeral head, which is the ball, as well as the glenoid, the socket. And it's extremely common. Uh, it's, it's performed up to 53,000 know, uh, patients per year. Uh, and studies have shown that really the incidence of shoulder replacements is dramatically increasing. By, by 2015, the procedures have increased by 322% in the 10 years preceding that. And by 2030, it's supposed to go up between six to 700% because you know, there, not only is there a, a increase, increasing age in our population, but there's an increased demand for it because patients realize they don't have to live with pain and loss of motion anymore. So it, it's always interesting to see where we are by looking from where we came from. And, and when you look at the first shoulder replacement, which it was before the 1900s by a French surgeon, it was for patients who had uh, tuberculosis. You know, it was a very rudimentary uh, implant. It didn't work very well. Uh, they kind of broke apart, fell apart. Patients didn't do great. And, and really progress kind of stopped because they just didn't really work that well. And if something's not working, and especially with patients, it's really hard to keep trying over and over again. You know, it really wasn't until the technology improved enough that we could start looking at shoulder replacements again. So what really turned our, our attention back to shoulder replacement was in the 50s. Uh, 
hip replacements were doing very well. And the way the reason the hip replacements were doing well is that we were, were able to restore the function by replicating the anatomy as it was before. Shoulder replacements really didn't have the technology before then to try to do that. But you know, the, 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 the father of shoulder surgery, Dr. Charles Neer, first started utilizing hip replacements, converting them slightly to fit the shoulder and, and realized that the that the results could be much better. So for patients who had you know bad fractures, bad arthritis, they now had an option. The results still weren't as good as they were today, but they were much better than they were in the past and at least started the uh, technological advancements that, that kind of proceeded over the, the next following decades. And so as mentioned before, um, it is really that, that looking at the hip replacements and kind of mimicking some of their, their principles and applying it to shoulder replacements. Uh, what they did was that, that, that the, the, the humeral bone was redesigned with a different type of implant and the socket uh, where the plastic goes, that was improved as well. Uh, and since that time, we've had 70 different shoulder systems that have been designed and they're increasing uh, um, almost by the year different options that we have compared to what we had even 10 or 15 years ago. So when we're looking at uh, the more uh, modern shoulder replacements, specifically anatomic shoulder replacements, uh, we have improved technology. We have improved metals. Um, we have metal mixtures that are, are, are much more uh, resistant to, to wear than they were you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, in the older days, we used to have huge stems that went all the way down the humerus. Nowadays, we do uh, short stems or even stemless. What that does is that preserves bone. By preserving bone, it allows us to do follow-up procedures without having the same complexity or uh, removing nearly as much bone. Uh, we have modularity. And what that means is that we can put different parts on, on the same. So you don't have to rip everything out every single time and restore a new implant. You can sometimes, if you're converting from one type of replacement to another, very simply take off the top, put another piece on uh, and move on. It makes revisions much quicker, less blood loss, easy recovery, much more satisfied patients in that. You know, that improves our range of motion and, and our implants last longer because of it. And once again, we have those two types of, of replacements that anatomic and reverse shoulder replacement. So when, when you're first being uh, evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon, it's always important to know um, uh, what are the steps that we're going through. The first thing was we always want to know if you have a medical history, because it's really important to know if you had rheumatoid arthritis, sor uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, kidney disease, anything that could affect our treatment options for you. Uh, we then look at your physical examination. We first look at motion. With arthritis, we can see you know, a, a variety of, of, of ranges of motions and limitations and um, some people have almost full range of motion, but significant pain. Some people have almost no motion as our arthritis advances over time. We always wanna look at shoulder strength. The reason that's important is because that can give us a, a clue to how strong that rotator cuff tendon is. It might affect what implant we're gonna use. We also look at stability because the, the shoulder socket is extremely small compared to what we have our, our hip socket and our knees. And when we start getting arthritis, we can start wearing away one side more than the other. That affects the mechanics of the shoulder. When the mechanics are affected, it accelerates that process even faster. So when we're doing a shoulder replacement, we have to take that into consideration. So our first step after we've done the clinical exam is to look at the x-rays and see how advanced that arthritis is. Um, if we're preparing for surgery, we usually take the next step and get a CT scan. What the CT scan does, or even an MRI for looking at the rotator cuff, the CT scan, though specifically for a shoulder replacement, it allows us to look at the bone. It lets us see if there's any bone loss at all, if there's any uh, st instability of the shoulder. And most importantly, we can take that CAT scan, put it in a computer program, make a 3D model of your shoulder and, and know exactly the deformity that we have. And, and we, can, we can try different implants in there and know what size implant we're gonna use, the effect it's gonna have on your arm. And for severe de deformities, we can actually get a specific guide that's made for you that we can put in the shoulder to, to place some of our wires, or even, you know, even the last three to six months, we can actually, we have something called patient match imp implants. What that is, we can actually uh, design an implant from the computer program. They're designed in France and they send it over to us. We have that implant ready for, for the time of surgery. So the, the amount of technology we've been able to, and information we can get from a CT is, is pretty amazing. And so, you know, the, the really question is, is who is a candidate for, for, uh, for shoulder replacement? Typically patients with, with advanced arthritis, um, uh, it's patients who have severe pain that interferes with daily activities, uh, pain while resting, uh, pain at night while sleeping, it may force, forcing you to toss and turn. Patients typically have uh, loss of motion or weakness. 
and have tried some form uh, of, of conservative management, either activity modification, steroid injections, platelet-rich plasma, anti-inflammatories, uh, or even physical therapy. So to kind of look at the different indications for the two different shoulder replacements, because this is a big decision for, for me as a surgeon, is first saying, what implant makes the most sense for you? You know, with hip and knee replacements, we really don't have to think this. We have, if there's arthritis, we have one type of implant primarily, and we use it. For patients with shoulder replacement, we have to look at a multiple different uh, 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 variables to see what makes the most sense for you. So for patients with, we're considering an anatomic shoulder replacement, for patients with arthritic conditions, but have an intact rotator cuff. Uh, they're typically younger patients uh, below the age of 70, uh, where we know the rotator cuff's nice and strong. Uh, we see this with osteoarthritis, which typically protects the rotator cuff, avascular necrosis, or when the bone can die, uh, and kind of, but it still preserves the soft tissue around it. And for patients who had some form of, of, of injury that damaged the cartilage, but may have left the soft tissue, uh, such as rotator cuffs intact. And the goal of, a, of, of an anatomic shoulder replacement is to really recreate the, uh, the native anatomy. Uh, and so, as mentioned before, there's really metal on one side and plastic on the other. Uh, but once again, it, it requires an intact or at least fixable rotator cuff tendon. And the implant has significantly uh, a design, designed, has, has significant improvements in its design. Uh, the humeral side really, for, for the most part, can be done with stemless implants almost every time, as long as there's, there's reasonable bone quality. There's, there's bo it's bone sparing. And the, uh, some important factors of this is number one, it can help recreate the anatomy, anatomy just as it was before. That leads to better outcomes. Uh, if you're putting a stem down the humerus, there's only so many combinations that you can put the implant on top to try to mimic the native anatomy. But by putting stemless, you can put it exactly where that uh, 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 humeral head is supposed to go. And because it's a small stem, if you ever fall or slip on it, you never have to worry about you know, fractures when it's this high up. Um, and for the patients who do need a stemmed implant or we've used stem implants in, in the past, we have now modular components where it's very easy to, 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 uh, to revise it from an anatomic to a reverse shoulder replacement in situations where patients do develop a rotator cuff tear in the future, but have had an anatomic shoulder replacement in the past. So it's a huge advancement for anatomic shoulder replacements and allows us to use them on, on more and more patients with better results. Now, the other type of arthritis that we mentioned before is a specific, specific type of arthritis called rotator cuff tear arthropathy. And what Dr. Neer found that was in the 1970s, they were putting these shoulder replacements in and having really good results for the most part. But there's a subset of patients that they noted that, that they had changes in the overall alignment of their shoulder, uh, function was bad. And those are patients who develop rotator cuff tears after uh, the shoulder replacement had, or even sometimes before the shoulder replacement was put in. Uh, for those patients uh, who have rotator cuff tear arthropathy, they had worse results with an anatomic shoulder replacement, resulting in loosening of the implant, pain, loss of function. And, and before the design of the reverse shoulder replacement, there wasn't really a lot of good options for them at that time, except to kind of have to live with it, which, which isn't ideal. And unfortunately, now we don't have to do that anymore. And these patients who develop rotator cuff tear arthropathy are patients who have torn rotator cuff tendons, uh, have a, a significant di difficulty in lifting their arms, not just from the arthritis, but because of the lack of, of muscles attached to the bone to lift that arm. And if we try to put an anatomic shoulder replacement in there, because there's so much instability of the shoulder joint and it changes the overall mechanical alignment, a conventional or uh, primary shoulder replacement uh, won't work. It will result in pain, implant loosening, as well as limited motion. And so for a reverse uh, shoulder replacement, it was designed by French surgeons in the 80s. And what the reverse shoulder replacement does, it takes the ball and socket and reverses them. By doing this, it allows the socket to be deeper. Because the socket is deeper, it, it, it makes what we call an implant semi-constrained, meaning it holds that shoulder in place and allows the big muscles of your arm, such as the deltoid, the pec, the latissimus, which are functioning just fine, to work more uh, mechanically uh, uh, advantageous and to be able to move that arm without the same limitations because you don't have a moving target anymore. It's nice and stable, and so it allows that function to come back right away. Um, when we do the reverse shoulder replacement, the main muscle that we start relying on is the deltoid muscle. Because of the design of the reverse shoulder replacement, number one, it stabilizes that shoulder so that humeral head is no longer riding up because there's no tendons holding in place. And also, um, uh, by lengthening the arm just slightly, about two to three centimeters, it maximizes the length of that deltoid, so maximizes the function of it. 
Once again, this was first developed in 1985 by a French surgeon, Dr. Paul Grimont. Uh, they had very successful results for decades in Europe. Uh, and eventually in 2004, uh, the FDA approved it for use in, in America. In 2004, the first reverse shoulder replant, uh, replacement was implemented. Now, the design from 2004 and even in the 80s compared to now has had dr dramatic differences. We now have smaller components, modular components that have multiple different pieces and parts. And we've, we've now started changing the overall alignment of an implant to uh, match a native shoulder much more than uh, the uh, original implants did. And so once again, a reverse shoulder replacement is for a patient with a complete torn rotator cuff uh, with severe arm weakness. This results in severe arthritis as well as uh, further rotator cuff tearing. Uh, it's also for patients who've had a, a prior surgery, such as a primary shoulder replacement that's failed either from implant loosening or for rotator cuff tear, patients who had uh, uh, an infection uh, that need a revision surgery. So really when we're talking about a, a, a primary shoulder replacement being converted to another shoulder replacement, is most typically a, a uh, either primary or, or a reverse shoulder replacement converted to a uh, secondary procedure, which could most likely be a, a, a revision reverse shoulder replacement. So the reverse shoulder replacement is really advantageous for in the setting of a revision uh, shoulder surgery. And so the, the modern reverse design has multiple different design options. We have more of an anatomic alignment compared to what we had before. Uh, the older implants were a little flatter, which helped move that arm down and make the deltoid function better, but it did affect the, the uh, cosmetic look of your arm because it, it was a little flatter on the side. By making it more anatomic, we have a nice contour of the shoulder again. Um, we have multiple different options, such as putting the implant into the bone or on top of the bone, um, the size of the implants. The older implants had smaller screws, which could break. Now the screws are, are very strong, uh, bigger, and uh, the fixation of the implant is much stronger. And in addition to just improved implants from technology, we also have other technological innovations, uh, such as for patients who have specific wear patterns, meaning they've had long-standing arthritis that's worn away one portion of the bone more than others. We have implants that have augments on them. What that means is we have metal that can uh, go at different angles to fit uh, uh, better. And as, as mentioned before, we actually, from our, our CT planning, can design an implant specifically made for the patient that can fill in all those gaps with metal that's sent over from France. You know, we have uh, uh, some that just come off the shelf, like you'll see at the bottom of the page uh, that have multiple different shapes, sizes, angles, uh, different size screws, posts, things uh, to improve fixation in the bone, uh, but it gets better and better. And so with this 3D software, we do a much better job than, you know, when I was, when I was a fellow, we didn't have, we had CAT scans, but we didn't have computer software. And you're really trying to guess and say, what makes sense? Does this need this? Does it does not need it? We do measurements, but nowadays we can actually take the implant 3D, put it in your, in the shoulder virtually and see the effect it's going to have on the body and see how well placed we can make it. We can get a preoperative guide uh, uh, design uh, specifically for a patient as well as, you know, uh, an implant design for it. And it's really patient specific. And, and, as we've noted with shoulders, there's so such a variety in deformities that we can see in bone loss that having the ability to treat each patient uh, individually can really improve the results. And so, some of the other uh, um, uh, technological advances we had is we can we can put sensors on the body and almost do robotic surgery where we're able to navigate in real time where those screws are going to help increase uh, um, the screw lengths, the screw purchase, and the stability of the implant overall. And really the next step is having uh, augmented reality where we can actually have goggles on, see the um, um, shoulder in front of us and be able to uh, place the implant with assistance from this. So originally, especially in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, the reverse shoulder replacements were, were just for patients who had rotator cuff tear arthropathy. But really those uh, indications have expanded and now reverse shoulder replacements is, is much more commonly put in than anatomic shoulder replacements, probably, you know, um, 70, 80% compared to anatomic shoulder replacements. And now we see for patients who are in the elder, elder, elderly population with advanced glenohumeral osteoarthritis, uh, patients who have uh, glenoid or humeral bone loss, um, uh, patients who have uh, uh, fractures uh, requiring an, an implant, revision arthroplasty, as we mentioned before, 
Uh, and there's some, uh, some patients we, we always want to make sure we don't put it in, such as an active infection or patients who we don't think we can actually get purchase uh, uh, in the bone with screws. But for the most part now, the implants improved to such a degree that those patients are kind of far and few between that we don't have the ability to, to put an implant in and get nice stable fixation. So patients are, are extremely satisfied with this. You know, the, the, one of the most successful surgeries that we've had in the last 50 years has been a hip replacement and shoulder replacements are now approaching that success rate with about 85%, 85% of, uh, to 90% of patients being uh, more than satisfied with the shoulder replacement. Uh, and the, the big question I always get is, is how long do these last? You know, the 10 year survivorship is now 90% and even up to 15 years, that survival rate is 85%. And those are for patients who, those implants are now 10 or 15 years old, you know, much poorer quality than what we have now. So really our goal is really get these implants to last for 20 years. And then, and, and to, to do a revision surgery with the newer implants is gonna be much easier, much less invasive than what we had in the past. So thank you guys very much. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the um, sidebar. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so we have some questions. The first question is, how long should I wait before having a shoulder replacement? And can I wait too long? Great, great question. I get that all the time. Uh, the, the answer is, I always say with arthritis, it's on your time. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have to rush and do it overnight. When we start thinking that uh, a shoulder replacement should be done sooner than later is when we start seeing bone loss. What that means is that when there's so such advanced arthritis that the mechanics have changed in your shoulder and it's eroding away the joint in a way that it might compromise the ability to put an implant in. So uh, regardless of the age at that point, if I think we have an opportunity to get it before it's too late, that's not, a, that's not the majority of patients. That's usually a minority of patients that need this. But those are the patients that we say, maybe we should do it now because if we wait four or five years, it's going to be a problem. So the, the, the simple answer is if you have a, um, a wear pattern of the arthritis that's just affecting, that's not specifically eroding away one part of the joint versus another, those are the patients uh, that, um, that can probably wait a little bit longer. But once you start missing part of your bone, we probably should get it done sooner than later. Okay. Um, when do you do reverse shoulder replacement? So that's, that's another great question. Really, it's something we debate all the time now. It used to be very simple. If you had a rotator cuff tear and arthritis, those are the people that got it and that was it. Patients were typically older than 70. Now that has completely changed. We use it for a lot of different patients. We use it for patients who have a significant, significant amount of bone loss that we think the reverse shoulder replacement is going to have better fixation than an anatomic shoulder replacement. We use it for patients who obviously have rotator cuff tears or prior surgeries in the past. Uh, patients uh, with advancing age, really past the age of 72 to 75, between that age range, I start considering doing the reverse shoulder replacement, even the setting of just arthritis, because if we can have one implant, it's probably going to last for 20 years. I'd rather do that than the risk of having a rotator cuff tear in the future. So th the simple answer is now is for patients who have very advanced arthritis that's affecting the amount of bone or the quality of the bone, elderly patients, patients with rotator cuff tears, and patients with fractures that we think uh, a reverse shoulder replacement would be a, a little bit more advantageous to the recovery. Can everyone have a stemless replacement? Uh, not everybody. I would say out of the, I do about, you know, 150 to 200 shoulder replacements a year and 99% of those for anatomic shoulder replacements, uh, I do stemless. Now the patients I can't do stemless on is when the bone quality is really just not good enough. And we kind of find that during the time of surgery. Now the stems are still short that we use, but I'd say maybe once every couple of years, uh, do I have to use a stemmed implant? Now the caveat to that for reverse shoulder replacements, we don't have stemless implants yet. That is coming out, but the amount of force put on the, the reverse shoulder replacement compared to a primary shoulder replacement probably doesn't make it the ideal uh, uh, option for stemless, but um, that, that it, technology is coming out soon. Can you dislocate a replaced shoulder? Yeah, just like the normal shoulder, uh, the native shoulder is the most unstable joint we have in our body. Same thing for shoulder replacements. For patients who have a primary shoulder replacement or the anatomic shoulder replacement, you know, as long as your rotator cuff is intact, typically we don't dislocate those. But if we have enough trauma that causes tearing of the rotator cuff, we can dislocate it. For the reverse shoulder replacement, that's one of the things we worry about. Because you're already missing enough soft tissue around there, the rotator cuff tendons, uh, labrum, 
uh, biceps tendon. So you lose a lot of st uh, stabilizers. It makes it easier for it to pop out of place for sure. Uh, the incidence is about one to 2% of the time. It's pretty rare for the most part, but it can definitely happen. Now that's not the end of the world. If it does dislocate, because sometimes the shoulders are, I, my analogy is it's almost like I get a pair of pants out of the dryer. They're tight. You walk around, it loosens up a little bit. That can happen with the reverse shoulder replacement. It's rare, but if it happens, we can just put a bigger size in. And most of the, most of the time that takes care of it. How often does someone with a primary shoulder replacement need a revision? You know, it's really, it's really less than 5% of the time. It's pretty uncommon. There's multiple different reasons why that can happen. One is, you know, you can have an infection, which is, you know, rare, but if it happens, those are typically uh, uh, where revision surgery to, or, no, uh, either most likely a reverse shoulder replacement would take place. Uh, patients who have uh, tear their rotator cuff over time, patients who implants become loose. Um, but as, as I mentioned, the 10 year survivorship is over 90%. So it, it's, it's for the most part, pretty far and few between that need uh, revision shoulder replacements. Do you ever revise a primary shoulder replacement with another primary replacement? You do, you know, historically speaking, the literature uh, and studies aren't as good. It can be done, especially for a young patient, you know, for a patient who has a shoulder replacement in their thirties uh, for, there's a variety of reasons we can see that. And they're having another shoulder replacement when they're young, you can try to do that. The results just typically aren't as good. And you already let answer this one, but how long do shoulder replacements last? You know, you know, we really, you know, the honest answer is we try to do these longitudinal studies to look at, uh, at their, how long they last. And, and, but we're looking at, at studies now that are 10 or 15 years into replacements, that technology is really outdated by now. So really the implants now, we have to assume the technology is better, the metal's better, the, the plastic's better, the mechanics are better. You know, our goal is, you know, um, really 15 to 20 years. And what we think with these, with the reverse shoulder replacements nowadays is what's going to happen is the plastic's going to wear out. And if the plastic wears out, that's almost like changing a tire. You pop up the plastic out, put a new piece in, and it should be good to go. The problem with the anatomic shoulder replacement is the plastic is put into the bone. And because if that wears away, that's where we start thinking about doing the reverse shoulder replacement, because it's hard to put another piece of plastic in a bone that already has holes in it. Can anyone get the new replacement from France? Uh, it is. It just takes about six weeks to order. Uh, you can order for any, anybody can have it. Um, we typically use it on patients who have pretty severe deformities that a, a conventional shoulder replacement uh, won't work. I mean, even over the counter, you know, we have so many options, even just from uh, over the, you know, off the shelf, over the counter, you know, that you have a variety of different, you know, angles, wedges, augments that, that you can do that, you don't really, most people don't need it, uh, but anybody can technically have it. And how long is the rehab for shoulder replacement? You, the rehab is, is pretty similar to any kind of orthopedic procedure where it's really six months to a year for the total rehab, but it, the reverse shoulder replacement is, is much quicker because you really don't have to rely on any rotator cuff healing. And so, you know, although people are still protecting it for the first six weeks, really out of, after two weeks, I start having them get out of it. Do, do daily activities. With an anatomic shoulder replacement, we have to cut through the tendon in the front and repair it on the way out. That's what slows down the recovery. We have to be a little bit more protective with it. But it's typically, it goes through the, the same three phases. It goes through passive range of motion or physical therapist is moving it for you. Then it transitions to active range of motion at six weeks to where you're moving it on your own, but no heavy lifting. And then at three months, uh, you start strengthening. So it really goes in six week blocks. So really by four and a half to six months, people are doing usually really well. And the biggest improvement we see is between three and six months after surgery, once you get into strengthening. Great. Um, are there any additional questions? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stevens. Thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Our next webinar will be held on Tuesday, July 11th. Dr. Jeffrey Gittens will be speaking. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you guys very much.